life. It is not defined by size. It is not defined by location or the need of a special environment. It is not defined by a level of development or the ability to defend itself. We know the signs of it. It is easy to recognize, even down to its quiet pulses and invisible waves. Life. We know it when we see it. We know it best when we see it taken away. Hello, I'm Alveda King. My uncle, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. This film explores the action of abortion and resulting consequences. You will hear personal real life testimonies and expert commentary as we go on this journey to explore what happens in the abortion industry and how lives are impacted. Few cultural markers are so apparent or have such a monumental impact on our society. This one was advanced by the exploitation of the vulnerable in a campaign of lies and deceit. Bypassing the legislative branches of government, this campaign was brought before our unelected judicial branch, unaccountable to the people. The court made abortion, a woman's right, the inherent authority to rule over her body and over the separate and distinct life growing inside of her. Euphemisms were employed to make the child seem less than human. This slaughter was sanctioned not under constitutional authority, but out of the darkest places of men's hearts. Effectively, it is a right to murder. To justify it, the court had to ignore the indisputable facts of science. It was as clear in 1973 as it is today, as it was in the mid-19th century, when state legislators codified abortion statutes in a change of the common law where abortion had been illegal but only after quickening. This change came after being informed by science that human life began at conception. In 1857, the American Medical Association, quote, the independent and actual existence of the child before birth as a living being is a matter of objective science. But once they realized it was a human being, then they put laws in place after the 1860s, after they understood that biology, there was a movement led in the states by doctors to prohibit abortion. Well, life was defined in the law at the time as an immediate gift of God, right inherent in nature in every individual, and it begins in contemplation of law as soon as the infant stirs in its mother's womb. Well, we have better instruments today to determine when life begins than they did. They, did, they said it began at quickening or when the baby kicked. But, of course, today we know it begins at conception. Justice Harry Blackman said, well, religion, science, philosophers, they disagree on when life begins. Therefore, the court will not take a position on when it begins. In Roe v. Wade, they said, at this state in the development of man's knowledge, we don't know when human life begins. Well, that's an intellectually dishonest lie. Well, this argument that we don't know when life begins is not an argument based on any biological facts. U.S. Senate report states, physicians, biologists, and other scientists agree that conception marks the beginning of the life of a human being, a being that is alive and is a member of the human species. There is an overwhelming agreement on this point in countless medical, biological, and scientific writings. It's definitely not the woman's body then, but it is still that new life, that new embryo, that new beginning as a separate human being. Now, if you want to know if there's a human being, I don't care what legal history said. I don't care what statutory history said. I don't care what philosophy said. I don't even care what theology says. If I'm a policymaker, I want to know what does science tell me about when you've got a human being. And even back then, in 73, science was clear you had a human being at day one. The amount of ignorance of just general biology, you know, is, is astonishing. 
I mean, we have a situation where we have politicians who go up and they, they quote things from the 13th century, you know, saying they don't know when life begins. I mean, anybody who's serious knows when life begins. I mean, the textbooks are there. The, the science is done. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. In striking down abortion laws, the court invented a right for women that had never existed and took away a right for the unborn that had always existed without any statute specifically affirming it. If every person on the planet has an inherent right to life, it begins when they become a human being. I find nothing in the language or history of the Constitution to support the court's judgment. The court simply fashions and announces a new constitutional right for pregnant women. Justice Byron R. White. The scientific facts should not be called into question. It's almost laughable the extent that some people will go to to try to question them. What they would see if you compared the mother's genome and DNA with the embryos, even at that very earliest stage, you'd see that these were two separate and distinct individuals. Distinct, we mean that you were a separate entity from your mother. You weren't part of her, though you were housed in her. And if you go to all the textbooks, you will find that they will resoundingly tell you that yes, when you have those 46 chromosomes, when you have that gender now identified, when you have that self-defining and self-propelling embryo that has all it needs to be continue in development to death, that is the beginning of human life. The embryology textbooks worldwide are uniformly in agreement that from the earliest stages of development, from the very beginning, you were not part of another human being, you are your own distinct, living, whole human being. The biology is very clear on when life begins. It's at conception. The, the heartbeat in a developing human usually starts at about oh, 23 to 25 days, barely past three weeks in development. But I've talked to hundreds of abortionists, and I have yet to have one not say somewhere along the line, I'm a murderer. Tony Levitino said, I'm a hitman. I take pay from somebody to kill their child. You have to remember that I then was in the abortion clinic telling other women that it was a blood clot, yet going back in the back room to make sure all the body parts were there as early as six weeks. You know, they're not, they're not stupid. They know when life begins, and they know that they end the life in an abortion at any stage. Most women wouldn't take, wouldn't kill their child if they were told this is a human being. You have the right to kill it, but it is a human being whose life is being terminated. Most women wouldn't do that. And we need to start using words that are true instead of using euphemisms to cover things up. Product of conception. Blob of tissue. Brother, you're a blob of tissue. I'm a, I'm a 250 pound blob of tissue. Every human being on the face of the earth is a blob of tissue. But that begs the question, do we going to protect that blob of tissue or are we going to allow it to be destroyed indiscriminately? The government is supposed to be the protector of our society, guardian of our inalienable rights. Yet for all their supposed wisdom, neither the courts nor most of our elected representatives claim to understand when life begins. Why do they ignore something that is so obvious to science? It might be that to admit life begins at conception, they would be admitting their own culpability, just as they sanctioned the slaughter of 50 million innocent lives. Imagine a court turning its back on history, on the law, on legal precedent, turning its back on the Constitution of the United States. That was our Supreme Court and its justices ruling as they did to sanction the violent in utero slayings of the innocent, violating their oaths of office, and turning their backs on millions of children who would be denied life. More than a decade ago, a Supreme Court decision literally wiped off the books of 50 states statutes protecting the rights of unborn children. 
Abortion on demand now takes the lives of up to one and a half million unborn children a year. Human life legislation ending this tragedy will someday pass the Congress, and you and I must never rest until it does. Unless and until it can be proven that the unborn child is not a living entity, then its right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness must be protected. And the founders of the Constitution said, in order to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, we do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. The primary purpose of the Constitution was to protect generations yet unborn and give them the blessings of liberty. No court has authority to contradict the Constitution. And when it's a plain contradiction, it should not be followed. Because the Constitution doesn't mention abortion in any respect whatsoever, they had to find it somewhere. And the court said, we find it in the penumbras, which means shadows of the Constitution. The Supreme Court cannot take away rights uh, that are so uh, inalienable. So Roe v. Wade, Doe v. Bolton is a fiction. It's a fiction that's cost over 50 million lives. The Supreme Court did not give an absolute right for women to kill their unborn children. In taking away what had always been a state right, they declared murder to be abortion, making it a medical decision, handing it off to physicians to decide in consultation with the pregnant woman. Roe was based on the fact that this should be a decision between a woman and a doctor. In a previous visit, he had very um, flippantly discussed the possibility of termination of the pregnancy if there were genetic problems with the baby. My oncologist was was pretty adamant that it was what I had to do. It was the only choice that I had. Um, it was the only way that I was going to survive. Um, and so they encouraged me to have an abortion uh, to save my life and to um, be rid of a child who was would be incompatible with life. While those advocating for abortion on demand celebrated the Roe decision, many in the legal profession, and even on the radical left, knew this was an indefensible decision from a legal perspective. Not only did the court contrive a right, it did so blind to history and blind to the precepts of science and the law. I will give you the opinion of the leading liberal law professor in America, Larry Tribe at Harvard, and he thinks it's an indefensible opinion. The Supreme Court itself in 1992 in Planned Parenthood v. Casey clearly said that if it was for them a question of first uh, impression, if it hadn't been ruled on before, they might very well not find a right to abortion. And then that court went on to say, but since it was found in 73 in Roe v. Wade, we have to respect it, which is just very bad um, legal logic that isn't followed in any other area of the law. Today, we define precedent as anything that a judge says, as long as he's higher than you are. And that the highest thing is not the judge, it's the Constitution of the United States. In no other area of the law do you do you protect a precedent simply because it's there? Because a decision that's wrong is an unconstitutional decision. So you'd have to, if you respect the Constitution, you'd have to overturn it. The myth is not that these are not children uh, or, or that these are not people. The myth is that we can take protection away from the children in the womb, but hold on to it for ourselves. The reality is we can't. As soon as you take protection away from anyone in the human family, individual or group, you've taken it away from everyone. The right to life is in the Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment to the Constitution. Nowhere is there a right to abortion. So the judges usurped their role as protectors of the Constitution when they created a right that was never intended to be in the Constitution. The law governs even the courts. And if you, you fail to, to, to recognize that basic principle, that judges are under law, then you have havoc. But it doesn't make it law. Law is made by the legislatures of the state, or by the United States Congress, or by a constitutional amendment. 
Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution that says the Supreme Court has the right to dis to make laws on everything. That's what you've got legislature for. Judges on the Supreme Court and at many levels of the judiciary have become corrupted by the power to interpret the Constitution. They now believe and they have admitted in their judicial opinions that the Constitution means what they say it means. And they can mean whatever they want it to mean. Second thing they said was, because the Supreme Court has resolved this difficult, divisive issue, Americans should accept that resolution uh, because to do otherwise would undermine the credibility of the court. If it was a bad decision by the Supreme Court, why should the American people accept it? They, they're saying just because the Supreme Court gave it and that it undermines the credibility of the court to challenge Roe. I think it undermines the credibility of the court to reaffirm Roe. Their oath is to uphold the Constitution, right? So if they're, if they're not going to overturn decisions that are contrary to the Constitution, and they know it, and they're only doing it because it's been there for a while, that would seem to violate their oath. The candid citizen must confess that if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by decisions of the Supreme Court. The people will have ceased to be their own rulers, having to that extent practically resigned their government into the hands of that imminent tribunal. Well, that was Abraham Lincoln on the occasion of his first inaugural address. Uh, he basically said, well, hey, if the Supreme Court's the final arbiter of, of what the Constitution says, then we have ceased to be our own rulers, and the Supreme Court is our ruler. A predictable outcome that has developed from this fabricated right can be seen in one segment of our society. If abortion continues and the prevailing trend persists, the African-American community will see a sharper decline in population as we are no longer at the 2.1 replacement rate necessary to maintain a stable population. In time, our distinctive population will become politically irrelevant. All we have fought for and achieved to this point in our history will have been for nothing but a brief moment when we did make a difference and did have a say on the American political stage silenced at the hands of abortionists. In the United States, since Roe v. Wade, about 10% of the white race has been wiped out by abortion. 28% of the black race has been wiped out by abortion. For every five African-American women that get pregnant, three choose to abort. Every day, 1,452 African-American children, just under 4,000 overall, are killed in the womb by abortion. African-Americans make up 12% of the population, but basically 36% of all abortions. So we are disproportionately affected by abortions. And the racist aspect of it, yes, yeah, it's, it's very clear. They're having abortions at twice the rate of the rest of, of American society. That doesn't happen accidentally. Abortion happens when people are targeted. After 35 years of abortion, we have lost 14 million lives. We only uh, make up 25 percent of all of their other services, but almost 45 percent of the abortions they perform. Each woman has to have 2.1 children to maintain a stable population in a developed country like the United States. For the first time in 2003, the black population went under 2.1 replacement, where the next few years of black population will actually begin to decline. As a black American, I know that most folks rank slavery as the worst thing that ever happened to America. But by virtue of the fact that I'm alive and here today, abortion most certainly would not have allowed me that privilege. So I say that abortion is the worst thing that has ever happened to America. Many people consider slavery to be the most heinous act that the United States government has ever condoned. And yet, there are others who know that even those Africans who were brought over on those slave ships and lost their lives, maybe one or two million, certainly are just a part of a serious act of oppression that still continues today. In America, since Roe versus Wade, 14 million African-American babies have been added to the number of those who have been oppressed because either of skin color and now gestational age. 
I think the greatest failure in reference to the abortion issue has been black leadership. I'm terribly, terribly, terribly concerned that the black church, uh, our black congressional representatives, and our social organizations such as the NAACP have been deathly silent on this issue. And if silence is consent, then we have this horrific reality that black leadership is helping to perpetrate the genocide of their own people. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Planned Parenthood of Georgia, strategically located in the heart of the Georgia State University community. All around you, you see the student buildings and young students walking back and forth in the community. People often wonder why young people and even children are having sex earlier and earlier. Well, it's not so hard to figure out. You have Planned Parenthood in the middle of your college communities, not far from your high schools, and young people walking back and forth. They can walk right in and get free birth control or very low price birth control and free condoms. And when the condoms don't work and when the birth control fails, they can go right back and get an abortion. 20 years after Roe v. Wade, that for 20 years people have organized their personal lives around the availability of abortion as a backup when contraception fails. Planned Parenthood is one of the biggest distributor of birth control devices, but these birth control devices fail two million times a year in the United States. And so what we see, according to the Allen Guttmacher Institute, which is a research arm of Planned Parenthood, is that nearly two out of three women obtaining abortions were using contraception when they got pregnant. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling, wonderful way to sell a product, then have the product fail, and then offer people abortions to cover up for the failure of your own product that you just sold them. We had a whole plan that sold abortions, and it was called sex education. Break down their natural modesty, separate them from their parents and their values, and become the sex expert in their life. So they turned to us when we would give them a low-dose birth control pill they would get pregnant on or a defective condom because we didn't buy the most expensive condoms. We bought the cheapest condoms. Our goal was three to five abortions from every girl between the ages of 13 and 18. As they get the children young, they get them sexually active. They say if they can only get a girl about at 16 to have an abortion, they got her for three or four more uh, because she'll remain sexually active, they give them contraceptives, they get the cheapest brand of everything, and um, and yet they put on this front that they're helpful and they've got everybody fooled. We gave them a low-dose birth control pill that in order to provide any level of activity had to be taken at the same time every single day. The girl wouldn't take it accurately, and if you miss that thing, the protection is out of her system. The sexual activity goes from zero or once a week to five to seven times a week. She doesn't take the pill properly. She gets pregnant, and who does she call when she's pregnant? She calls us. We're the experts. And we were ready. We used a script designed to overcome every single objection. That's what sales is, overcome the objection, and you get the order, in this case, the abortion. And uh, when she calls, the first question is reassure. And so the girl confesses, I think I may be pregnant, and the counselor, is, who's really a telemarketer, that's all they're trying to do, sell over the telephone, but we call them counselors, says, we can take care of your problem, no one needs to know. And then the first question, what's the first day of your last normal period? And she gives this so-called counselor the date, and she says you're eight weeks pregnant. She didn't say you might be eight weeks pregnant, she didn't say you could be, she said you are eight weeks pregnant. So she has planted the first seed in this long marketing thread. And the sad thing is, in this girl's mind, she is the expert. This is the pregnancy expert. And the next question is, is this good news or bad news? If it were good news, she would not be calling an abortion clinic. It's bad news. And when she replies bad news, this counselor moves right in because now she wants to identify the fear, to use it to reaffirm that abortion decision any time that girl moves away. And if she says, well, maybe, maybe I need to think about this. Your parents will kill you. You'll have to miss drill team. The abortion is so. What's in a name? Sometimes people wonder why Margaret Sanger chose the name Planned Parenthood for her organization. Initially, Planned Parenthood was called the Birth Control League. People thought the word control was too intimidating, too threatening. 
And so they said, let's make it sound like something nice, planned parenthood. So when people look for us, they think we want to help them plan something that's good for them. So therefore, we have the name Planned Parenthood. How deceptive. Planned Parenthood helps people through the influence of Margaret Sanger, its founder, to sterilize people, to abort babies, to murder babies, and to hurt women. Planned Parenthood performs the lion's share of abortions in America, all under the name of something that sounds so helpful, Planned Parenthood. Margaret Sanger said that she wanted to rid the world of human weeds, and the Nazis said exactly the same thing, life unworthy of life. She was a racist and eugenicist, and the purpose of her organization, which was originally called the American Birth Control League, was summed up by one of its mastheads on the Birth Control Review, which was to breed a race of thoroughbreds. Another one of the mastheads was birth control, a sure light in our racial darkness. One of the people who sat on her board, one of her most trusted advisors, was Lothrop Stoddard, who wrote a book in 1922 called The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy. And in it, he said that crossings with the Negro are always fatal. Margaret Sanger, when she started the American Birth Control League and later Planned Parenthood, had an agenda a eugenic agenda to quote unquote get rid of the inferior races. Planned Parenthood today refuses to admit that Margaret Sanger is a racist. We did not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out the idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. Margaret Sanger. While no direct link has been established between Margaret Sanger and Adolf Hitler, there are enough Nazi connections to see that their thinking was in line with each other and that they shared many of the same twisted ideals. This is little known, but in the United States, forced sterilization of minority women only stopped in 1972. Uh, several hundred thousand minority women were forcibly sterilized against their will under the Buck v. Bell uh, Supreme Court decision of 1929. One of the Supreme Court justices uh, said famously, three generations of imbeciles is enough. Uh, the Negro Project was specifically aimed at uh, having people go throughout the South and con convince the Negroes not to have children. Margaret Sanger was deeply involved in eugenics in the United States. Hearts of the ideas that the Nazis came up with were generated by U.S. and uh, British eugenicists. In Margaret Sanger's premier publication, which was called the Birth Control Review, they ran articles written by doctors of the Third Reich. We also know that, that in Nazi Germany there was a Dr. Hans Harmsen who was writing all of the sterilization laws for the Third Reich. And that after World War II, Hans Harmsen was part of the, the group that started the German affiliate of the International Planned Parenthood Federation. So there are a lot of connections between the atrocities that went on in Nazi Germany and Planned Parenthood. Although forced sterilizations of black women ended in 1972, the eugenics movement continued with the striking down of state laws in 1973 with the onset of Roe versus Wade. While the method had changed, the outcome was still in place. But now, eugenicists would be able to continue to kill babies and hurt women on a massive scale. With the targeting of minority communities and encouraging abortions at a high enough rate, they could ensure a decline in the population of those that Margaret Sanger considered to be weeds. Planned Parenthood is nothing more than a shell for the eugenics campaign that began a couple hundred years ago. This whole holocaust in the African American community is based on racism by Planned Parenthood. Most people are familiar with Roe, the case that made abortion possible through the first trimester. It was the case of Doe versus Bolton, centered about Sandra Kano, that made abortion possible through all three trimesters. This decision made it possible to kill a fully viable human being up until the very day of birth.
Most people think abortion is legal only to three months of, of pregnancy in the United States, whereas we all know, those of us who are in the business know that this is legal for all nine months of pregnancy until the very day of birth. Now, abortions are done through all nine months of pregnancy, not because of Roe v. Wade, but because of Doe v. Bolte that said for the health of the mother, an abortion can be completed through all nine months of pregnancy. But the problem was that health was defined as mental health. And we would say to this scared young woman, you would have problems with this pregnancy should you carry it to term, wouldn't you? She'd say yes, and we'd chart it emotional health. Over 60% of the people didn't believe that abortions took place past 20 weeks. Unfortunately, abortion has been decriminalized all the way through the moment of birth. Once the protections of life were removed from all nine months of pregnancy, Planned Parenthood accelerated their eugenic agenda by placing a majority of their now legal abortion clinics in minority neighborhoods. Planned Parenthood Federation of America locates most of its abortion clinics in minority neighborhoods. Planned Parenthood does most of its abortions on minority women. Knowing they could not get the approval of the people, nor of the legislatures of most of the states, nor Congress, those seeking to legalize abortion armed themselves with lies and false statistics. Bypassing the lawmaking branch of the government, they took their contrived evidence to the courts. In NARAL, we generally emphasize the drama of the individual case, not the mass statistics. But when we spoke of the latter, it was always 5,000 to 10,000 deaths a year. I confess that I knew the figures were totally false, and I suppose the others did too. Dr. Bernard Nathanson, co-founder of NARAL. The true numbers were before abortion was legalized, about 40 to 70 women died every year of abortions in the United States. Now the trouble here is that those were all very heavily publicized. After Roe v. Wade, they're covered up. So we think that the number of 50 to 100 uh, women being killed by so-called safe and legal abortion is probably still accurate in the United States. Those seeking to end laws protecting the unborn found the perfect pawns to take the fall in their deadly crusade. Sharp, articulate, well-educated women were driven to prey on their vulnerable sisters, manipulating them into thinking their support for abortion would make their lives significantly better. Both Norma McCorvey and Sandra Kano, whose names are forever linked with the murder of unborn babies, never had abortions. They gave life to their children while shrewd lawyers used their names to suck the life from millions of other so-called unwanted children. Sarah Weddington and Linda Coffey had to have a pregnant woman who would sign the form, who would sign on the dotted line. I am not an Ivy League person, never have been. When I came alone, I, I was just like the, uh, the prize they had waited for. You know, I was illiterate, you know, I, I wasn't, um, I was more self-contained than I was about the world. I mean, I, I was, I was trying to live each and every day, and um, they knew that, and they took full advantage of it. But I think all of this was underhanded. I went to her innocently. I didn't have money. I needed a divorce, and I wanted my two children home. She had put the point to me, if a woman and a man work, should they not be uh, able to make the same amount, they did the same job. To me, that made sense, and I said, sure. I had no knowledge that this was to do with abortion or trying to legalize abortion. I went down to Linda Coffey's office. I um, was trying to read what I was signing. Uh, and they said, oh no, don't worry about it. We're your friends, we're going to help you. I never had to go to any of the court proceedings. I did, the only thing I did was sign the piece of paper that brought Roe versus Wade into being. While these lawyers were calling for the right of choice for women, Where's the choice when only one option is offered? That's an essential fallacy in the woman's so-called right to choose. In most cases, it's not a choice at all. A decision is reached without all the facts or based on misinformation. Other options are not presented and a deadly course of action is forced on a woman. We have to talk about um, something that uses lies, uh, coercion. The number one slogan for abortion is pro-choice. And the ironic thing about that slogan is that when you ask women who had abortions, why did you have that abortion? 
the number one response is, I felt that I had no choice. A majority, maybe upwards of 80% of abortions in America happen with some form of coercion. In other words, not the woman's choice. I had this one lady that called me one afternoon and she said that she wanted to make an appointment for her daughter to come in and have an abortion. I said, does she want to have the abortion? Well, you know, it's not her, it's not her choice. So I went to a counselor, a Christian counselor, and she kept saying I needed to have an abortion, and then this was not a good thing for me to do, and it wasn't going to be good for my kids. Then I told my fiance, then I told my mother, then I told my other family members. All of a sudden, everybody's like, you can't do this, you can't do this, you don't want to do this, this is not good for the kids, this is not good for you, this is not good for our marriage, I don't want to raise this child. It would have been somebody who would have changed the dynamic of our family and the relationships that they would have created would have changed everyone that they interacted with but they're not here in abortion it's not about choice it's about despair it's not about people who are getting abortions because of freedom of choice it's about people getting abortions because they feel they have no freedom and no choice through conversations with him him pushing the abortion and then um, that kind of frustrated me at some point. I just got, I felt, I don't know, I just felt like he didn't care about me, that he was just thinking about, like, let's fix this. That's what exactly his words, we need to fix this. That I was in fear and in crisis, and at that point that I felt like I had no choice. Women are the victims. Um, in a lot of these cases, women are coerced and in crisis mode and regret what they the decision that they've made. Women feel threatened that if they don't have an abortion, um, their lives will be punished for it. Um, the stories of the boyfriend saying, I'll give you the $300 and our, our relationship will continue if you have the abortion. If you choose to keep the baby, there's the door. I was dating a young man and we got pregnant. And the first words out of his mouth to me were, you're not having it, are you? And I remember that sinking feeling in my heart and I thought, well, no, I guess not. And I was, felt so much pressure. Absolutely do not think that my choice was a choice. I think it was, like I said before, I think it was felt like an ultimatum. They're all screaming at me. It felt like they were screaming at me. They were constantly insisting, you've got to kill him. You've got to abort him. You can't do this. You've got to go to the clinic. You've got to hurry up. Every week that you wait is making it worse. Go, 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 go. And I finally couldn't take all of their pressure and how supposedly I'm going to make everybody's life miserable. It was relentless. It was like I couldn't even go through the day without hearing them, whether they were actually speaking to me or I'm just remembering something they said to me a couple of hours ago. I mean, they just bombarded me with it. So I guess I have to bear this burden so that everybody else can be okay. Too often, through coercion, the woman goes on to have an abortion, convinced she's in trouble, and that the procedure will get her out of it. Unfortunately, the trouble has only just begun. The physical and emotional consequences of her decision are often devastating, well outlasting the nine months she would have carried her baby, or even the time it takes for that baby to reach adulthood. We remembered what our girlfriends looked like before and after. Because abortion goes to the core of who we are as women. And, and the fact that we are involved in, in nurturing life, that, that an abortion experience really does leave a mark. There's something that happens to a woman's mind once they pass what I call that fine line. Abortion is so shameful and secretive that many women don't tell anybody that they've had an abortion. They won't say anything for 20, 30, 40, 55 years, sometimes on their deathbeds. Nobody knows because they're so traumatized. Silence. It can also have psychological effects, short and long term for the woman. The Supreme Court itself said in the Gonzalez v. Carhartt case that this is not rocket science, uh, unexceptional to note that some women have negative consequences from abortion. She'd say, well, I, I'm pretty sure that you have 
you know, post-traumatic stress disorder from the abortion that you had when you were 14. And I said, yeah, no, that's not what it is. <laughs> I always thought, you know, it's, I have major depression or I'm bipolar or all these other things that other doctors had diagnosed me. It was definitely my abortion that had caused serious emotional trauma for so long. We have more and more men and women who've had abortions are speaking up about it. And as they testify to the pain and the despair that abortion has brought, as they testify to the fact that abortion didn't solve their problems but only created more of them, then they are, by their very testimony, they're making it impossible for the, the other side to say, listen to the voices of women, this is a positive thing for women. That's, of course, what they've been trying to say for decades, and now those very voices are telling them abortion is a bad thing. And then later women come to deeply regret and suffer years of nightmares and anxiety and incredible pain and anguish. Why do so many women, including myself, have dreams about their children? And especially in my situation where I didn't think of it as being a child, but I had nightmares and dreams about children. I know a lot of women have suffered from um, having nightmares, hearing babies crying in the night, inability to bond with uh, living children. The fear of being found out. What if people knew what you've done. When well, people think you're a godly woman, but they have no idea that you've killed four people. Grief and the shame just about buried me at times. After I left there and went home, um, I guess it was the hormones or whatnot set in and just the emotions, the reality of what all happened. And I remember just curling in a corner and pulling out my hair and just think, I can't believe, I can't believe I had done this. Rather than just go through a nine month crisis pregnancy that I've gone through about 20 years of hell on earth, just by exercising my right to choose. Women are constantly said, they didn't tell me I'd suffer for years from my abortion. They didn't tell me I'd have nightmares about my baby. Uh, they didn't tell me I'd come to regret it so deeply that I would rather kill myself than go on living. Uh, nah, it's 10 minutes, you'll never have to think about it again. That's a lie. One of the most devastating effects of abortion on some women is suicide. Some studies have indicated that teenagers who have an abortion are up to six times more likely to take their own lives within a year of having terminated their pregnancies. Many more women contemplate and even try suicide in an attempt to end the pain that they feel. True numbers may never be accurately reported, but suicides and attempted suicides among women who've undergone abortion are a reality the other side does not want to admit. I figured the only way to escape the torment was to take my own life. And being the chicken that I was, I got about as high as I could and I got in my bathtub filled with water. And with the razor blade, I cut my wrist. And I began to just lie there and watch the, the water in the tub turn red. It wasn't something that was happening consciously that I could say, man, I'm really sad that I had the abortion so I'm going to use these drugs. It was just that deep, empty, hopeless feeling that there was nothing worth living for and, you know, plotting how I was going to end my life <laughs> so many times. I was diagnosed with clinical depression in 1991. I'm sure it came from the abortions. I became extremely suicidal after my abortions um, to the point where I did attempt to take my own life a couple of times. We had a 12-year-old. She came in chewing her gum and looked so carefree. She had her abortion. She came back two weeks later for her checkup. Didn't come out of the room, didn't come out of the room, opened the door and she was in there. She brought, brought in a piece of glass and slitting her wrist. 12 years old. But we all have that moment where we realize that we are moms and we killed our children. It's pretty sick. It's a sick feeling. Warnings are rarely offered. Women are seldom told the full story of what they're getting into when they authorize an abortionist to kill the baby inside of them. 
Even if the known consequences and after effects like breast cancer, barrenness, and other female trauma, even if it only impacts half the women or a quarter of the women, wouldn't it be better to let them know what they might suffer from their choice? Wouldn't it still be wise to let them know every potential risk? The government mandates warnings on every other potential danger, every pack of cigarettes, Every alcoholic beverage, every package of medication carries a warning of potential health risks. Why not a warning on something so life-changing, so life-threatening as an abortion? There's a lot of evidence of physical and psychological consequences. Then there was a big study out of New Zealand about two years ago that showed long-term consequences. Abortion can have long-term consequences on the woman in terms of affecting her fertility. Many women become infertile. They suffer from other problems with their female organs and end up having to have complete hysterectomies, never able to conceive or have other children. One of our ladies, the, the power of the suction machine from the abortion was so severe that it caused her fallopian tubes to collapse and she was never able to have children. Abortion is surgery and carries significant risks. Unlike surgeries that will save a life or relieve suffering, abortion is an elective surgery of convenience that is rarely performed to save the life of the mother. I wasn't in for all of that abortion. Somebody else was in there with him. But I went in toward the end and I'd never seen that much blood. I mean, you know, just blood everywhere. And we put her in the recovery room and she just filled the bed. And we changed the bed a couple of times and her blood pressure was erratic and the doctor left. I was really worried about her and I tried to call him and her boyfriend kept wanting to go home and her blood pressure stabilized a little bit, but I just didn't believe she was, you know, it's just like that feeling you have that she's not right. Well, at 10 o'clock, the boyfriend said, look, if there's anything happens, I'll call you immediately. And at 4.30, he called the doctor, and he didn't take the history, and he, put, he said put her in a tub of hot water, and when he did, the last little bit of blood in her body ran out. And he called me about 6 and said, she's dead. And he immediately started telling me how he was going to do the cover-up. And somehow it all worked out, and the autopsy didn't show anything, and no charges were filed, and nothing happened. The newspapers didn't call. Nobody came. We killed that woman and, and did abortions the next morning. And many times you'll see... Uh... A young lady who's been killed by abortion and on the death certificate you see something like spontaneous gangrene of the ovary or a therapeutic misadventure or something like that. The families are so hurt by what's happened and shamed that their daughter had this abortion and died from it or whatever, they don't come forward. You see abortion um, makes, a, makes a doctor almost lawsuit proof because the woman is so ashamed that she went to get an abortion that even if he butchers her so that she has to have a hysterectomy, they aren't going to say anything to anybody about it, nothing, because they don't want anyone to know. We had one girl, 22 years old, a model, who danced in, jumped up on the table, laughed at the doctor that she didn't wear underwear. She was 22 weeks pregnant. We put her on the table. now. There's a maneuver called the Hansen's Maneuver. Now, the doctor may do it himself, or someone may do it, but I did it for the big baby, two of our big baby abortions. I held the babies, and you say the head's here, the feet are here, the buttocks are here, and you gently push the baby down into the instruments. And the first time this doctor went in, he pulled out omentum. That's the lining to the intestines. He literally perforated her uterus and was pulling her bowel out her uterus with the very first time he went in with the, the instruments. And the second time he went in, he pulled out her bowel and he pushed it back in, live baby, woke the woman up, put her in my car because it's terrible, terrible advertisement to think about having an ambulance in front of an abortion clinic. You just don't want it. So we put her in my car and we didn't take her to the hospital nearest us. We didn't take her to the hospital that would take the best care of her. We took her across town to a hospital that would help us cover up what we'd done. And this surgeon is taking this girl who has a perfectly complete baby inside her with her bowel pulled out her vagina upstairs to the operating room. Seven doctors operated on that baby, on that girl, 
They had to do a colostomy to resection her bowel to empty into this bag. They pulled the baby out. He rolled it into the disposable drapes and put it into the incinerator at the hospital. All seven of those doctors falsified the records. We kill that baby that way. The doctors falsified the records. We told that girl she had an abdominal pregnancy and she didn't sue us. In Roe, the court made the issue of abortion a decision between a woman and her doctor. The real outcome of Roe is that deciding whether to keep the baby or terminate its life in the vast majority of cases is left up to the woman in crisis in consultation with a person who earns a living by selling abortions. The ring of the cash register has taken the place of the cry of the newborn. Most women in America who've had abortions will tell you they never see the abortionist, they never see this doctor until he's between their legs in the abortion clinic, violating them with instruments. The women almost never consult their physicians. They go to a clinic. They have decided they want to get an abortion. So this idea of the important role of the personal physician is a fantasy. The court talked in terms of where well, we have a, you know, a medical practitioner, a doctor-patient relationship, and the physician is going to do what's best for his patient. And you know, you hear the testimonies of these women; they don't see the the, the doctor until he's there performing the abortion on her. There's no there's no doctor-patient relationship. With the success of Roe versus Wade at the courts. Margaret Sanger's racist eugenics organization became a part of the American culture. A new multi-billion dollar industry was launched with Planned Parenthood at the forefront. This industry maintains its influence and power with the same arguments and lies originally used to decriminalize abortion in 1973. There were two great lies about abortion. One, it's not a baby, and two, it's good for women. We must also examine another motivation of Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry, the desire to make money to further their cause. Money is made selling sex education, selling contraceptives they know will fail millions of times a year, then selling abortions to take care of the failures, at times selling the baby parts that come from those abortions. It is easy to see that the abortion industry is an endless cycle of making money. It is only when women plan on parenthood that the abortion industry loses. I don't think anyone ever believed that we would see an industry develop that's largely a cash industry that is largely unregulated to perform abortions. And they're using our tax money. One third of their billion dollar budget is our money. They have worked very hard to learn how to get Medicaid funds and they want to increase their tax funding to 700 million a year. Planned Parenthood was allowed to come in and talk to us or other organizations talk to us. Liberal teachers talked to us during sex ed. No one called it a baby. Product of conception. It can be removed if you don't want it. In legalizing abortion, the Supreme Court opened the floodgates for an industry to make billions of dollars off the pain and suffering of women and the deaths of millions of innocent babies, a way to exploit the crisis situation so many women find themselves in. At a time when women are at their most vulnerable, court-sanctioned abortionists offer a service promising to solve the problem. But unlike other businesses, they leave their clients having to deal with the consequences without offering a warranty or even a refund when their product proves defective. Abortion is a skillfully marketed product sold to a very frightened person in crisis. They buy that product expecting a fix and find it's defective. We were told that we had to make $40,000 a weekend in order to stay here. Of course, we found out later that he was lying, that he just wanted to build up his, his money resources, you know. Uh, abortion is a very lucrative business. So we put a clinic out on 30. It uh, paid for itself in the first month. It was a profit center. And we were well on the way to opening more clinics. As a matter of fact, our plan was to open three abortion clinics in 1983 so I could be a millionaire in 1984. There's a lot of money involved. We never would take personal checks. Uh, we didn't, we'd take credit cards, but we frowned on it. 
We always encourage the ladies to bring cash. Why is that? So, a lot, you don't have to report cash, friend. You know, they came in for two or three hours and wanted to do 20 abortions or 30 abortions and make their money and go away. They didn't care if the instruments weren't clean and they didn't care if the instruments weren't cool. They just wanted to get their money and get through the day and go. There was a receipt on the chart. They would collect them, bring them up at the front at the end of the day. We would balance them, pay them in cash, no 1099, no W-2. But I'm certain people killing babies for a living probably reported it to IRS, don't you think? We will never know for sure how much money is made because the abortion industry hides behind the skirts of their patients in declaring medical privacy. It's a business and we can't deny that fact. That's what gives it a certain amount of coercive and secular power. The money that is generated by abortion then gets plowed back into the political realm to support candidates who will keep it going. When an organization makes millions upon millions of dollars on providing abortions and sometimes in a community they're the sole proprietor. They've got a monopoly on it. Uh, why wouldn't they then encourage more abortions? Because more abortion means more money. More money means that they can go back to the government coffers in the case of Planned Parenthood and say, look at all the good we're doing. And so they can ask for more government money. Planned Parenthood is expanding now. They're building gigantic abortion clinics in anticipation of socialized medicine because they hope that if a Democrat becomes a president of the United States, there will be socialized medicine brought in and then they can charge between $1,000 to $1,500 for even first trimester abortions and have them all paid for by the government. The abortionist has a financial interest in the woman having an abortion because he gets paid if she has an abortion. He doesn't get paid if she doesn't. Now, what do, you, what do you think he's going to tell her to do? We knew how many people, how many calls they got, and what their percentage of completion was. And their raises were based on the percentage of completed abortions. And they got bonuses and could make pretty good money doing that. If helping women were at the heart of the abortion industry, the so-called service of ending the baby's life could be offered for far less money than is typically charged. The clinic could remain in business and still realize a profit. But that's not it. The abortionist and the abortionist clinic thrive by taking advantage of women in crisis. Very quickly, it was no longer about selling abortions to other women. It was about money. I saw the potential to make great money. I answered the phone at home at night so we wouldn't miss an abortion. But she is allowed to watch her pregnancy test turn positive or negative, and they would point to a chart on the wall and say, this is a positive test and this is a negative test. And if it's positive, we trained our people to reach over and grab the bony part of her elbow and squeeze. And you see, she's confused. She's hurting. She's just gotten this news that she's pregnant, and she's upset. So you grab the bony part of her elbow and squeeze to get her attention and say, if you have your money, we can take care of this right now. They did a pregnancy test. They said it was positive, And they asked me, did I have the money? They told me if I didn't have it that day that I would have to come back and it would cost more money because I was right at the 13-week point. You see, we knew if she went home and talked about it, her support system might help her and might tell her abortion wasn't the answer. But if she just did it right then, it was taken care of. But. A certain percentage of those pregnancy tests are negative. They're not all positive. And remember, it costs the same amount of money to get a non-pregnant one in as it does a pregnant one. So if her test was negative, we had a different sales technique. We said, this test is negative. But you know, this test is not sensitive enough to pick up a very early pregnancy. You could still be pregnant and this test would be negative. And you want to know for sure today, don't you? And she would say yes. And we'd say, okay, we have another test we can do. We will just do this sonogram. And we put her on that table as I could put any man, woman, or child on that table. And I could find a pregnancy. You see, all you have to do is find a blob. And everyone's abdomen has a blob. And this girl doesn't know what a pregnant uterus looks like versus a negative one, so you just find a little blob in the abdomen. You flip it around and say, see there, there it is, you're pregnant. She's shocked. You grab the bony part of her elbow and say, if you have your money, we can just take care of it today. We know of one 16-year-old who was told she was pregnant. They did an abortion on her. You don't see what they take out. There was no baby there. And um, she committed suicide. And in the investigation, they, they uh, got her papers and had no PG or not pregnant. 
I mean, the studies are there that shows that abortion is bad for women's health, emotional, physical health. But yet those studies keep getting stifled. They keep getting questioned. They keep getting undermined because of the fact that there is a great deal of money made in the abortion industry. You know, and that money that the politicians are getting from NARAL and now, you know, the different um, pro-abortion organizations, Planned Parenthood, Marie Stopes International, I mean, that is money that is funding campaigns and is supporting candidates. You don't go against that money. You don't speak against it. Abortion has far-reaching consequences that those profiting from it don't want women to know. At a time when we expect our government to ensure our safety, why has the government been so slow to regulate an industry that has harmed untold numbers of their patients? This doesn't just affect the woman. It doesn't af just affect the father. It affects an entire family, and it tears families apart. But she had always wanted a big sister as an only child. And when she was eight years old and found out that I should have had an, an older child, there was somebody missing in her life. And then she went, well, wait, where's the baby? And I am. Um, I had to explain to an eight-year-old what abortion was. OK, let me just make sure I get this straight. And she, she was standing right in front of me. And she said, you were 16, you were pregnant, and you killed your baby. And I had to look that little girl in the eye. And I had to say yes. And this look of terror went across her face. And she didn't say anything more. She just walked away. And I asked family members to go with me. They didn't want to go. They didn't want to go. They want me to do it, but they didn't want to go. And my fiance didn't want to go. I finally found somebody who would go. Nobody, anybody that was telling me to do it, none of them wanted to go. Some men have had no choice. Uh, the woman chose abortion um, without them, and they didn't have any control over it. Abortion steals the destiny of not only women, but of the men who participate, the men who've lost children, of their families. It destroys relationships. A man had come, come to our table. I had an exhibit booth. And I was explaining to him the work that we do. And he looks up at me, and tears are streaming down his face. And he was sobbing like a baby. And he says, it's been 35 years. And I still hurt every day from it. We can't be silent anymore. Millions of women's lives have been devastated. And the fathers, we just write them off. They're just forgotten about. But I'm telling you, the multitudes of people that have been hurt by abortion, it's just unfathomable. With Roe, the Supreme Court took away from the states the right to restrict abortions within their own jurisdictions. But it was thought that the states would regulate the clinics that performed the procedure. The truth is, for years, they were left alone. The dirty back alley abortionists simply moved into the open without cleaning up their operations. This was a highly profitable business, and the safety of women was seldom a factor when it came to the bottom line. You know, we were doing 20, 30 abortions an hour if we could, at least 20. We had 21 sets of instruments. That's all we had. So we couldn't possibly bring those instruments out, clean them, sterilize them, bring the temperature up in the sterilizer, for tw and then 20 minutes sterilization, and then cool them down. I've had um, more experience than I'd like to have ever had on the dirty, filthy conditions inside of abortion clinics. When we were in Southern California, we would chase these little rotten abortionists around LA and San Diego and Orange County, and they would set up in these little strip malls, literally sign a lease today and be killing babies tomorrow. We would go and dig in their trash cans and they would take the cash receipts and throw them away and the babies would just be thrown in with the daily trash, obviously violating uh, all the health codes in the book. Well, yeah, I mean, the, we had an infection rate of about 75%, you know, but that was just from unsterilized equipment. Our complication rate at the end of my time, last 18 months, was when about one out of every 500 had a major life-changing surgery or died. We had one woman die. 
but because there are no real statistics and if you can cover it up, you don't report it. And none of ours were ever reported. So we don't really know. Some of the conditions we sent our operatives in, and I've been in there personally, you'd see literally blood on the floor, blood on the walls, you know, cockroaches and mice feces. Some of these places, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to get your hair cut in these places, let alone have a very invasive surgical procedure. The big hospital in Dallas will tell you, the doctors will tell you that they saw botched abortions or see botched abortions all the time. One of the reasons we were able to regulate the abortion clinics in Texas was because of the bad abortionists that had been reported. I mean, one girl died and they went in to examine the clinic and they were using rusted instruments and had no sterilizer and no hot water. The life of the woman who decides to abort her baby will never be the same. There will never be a day when that decision won't affect her in some way, physically, emotionally, or spiritually. But the consequences of taking a baby's life aren't hers alone. The men and women who work in the abortion industry pay a price as well. Seeing the killing of innocent babies day in and day out takes an enormous emotional toll. But uh, no one talks about what happens inside the abortion clinic. And everyone fights. It's the most chaotic place you can imagine. Um, the doctors fight, the nurses fight, everybody's taking drugs, everybody's on drinking, it's, you know, they're having affairs. This movement is surrounded by so many lies and distortions and obfuscations that the vast majority of people haven't the slightest idea what an abortion is. But it's pretty gruesome to look at that baby and see that it really is a human being. And, you know, no different from you or me, except in size. I recognized I'd been involved in the death of 35,000 babies. The murder of one woman who bled to death from a second trimester abortion. 19 women who'd had hysterectomies or colostomies. And never had one appeared in the newspapers, no lawsuit. But the thing I couldn't deal with was the fact that I had taken the life of my own child by abortion. You can't deal with death and lies on a daily basis without being greatly affected by it. And nobody worked in that clinic that didn't go to the back and put baby's parts together. And even if you didn't put the parts together, there were times when you walked back there and they were on a towel I conscripted a fellow gynecologist who was doing abortions at that time to put an ultrasound transducer on the abdomen of women who were having abortions, which depicted the fetus being chased by the abortionist uh, and ultimately killed, sucked out, and decimated. I already knew that what was going on was not right, but during this five-day process they would insert this expandable seaweed thing into your cervix to slowly dilate you over the five-day process. About the third day I was laying on a, an examination table and my baby began to kick a lot on that table and I remember thinking something is wrong and she's trying to tell me that and she was right because then George Tiller came in and he proceeded to insert a large needle into my abdomen and almost immediately my baby stopped kicking and I never felt her again so I know that's the moment that she died but it took another two days approximately before I went into labor the nurse would, you know, walk down the line, shove her hand under the blanket, feel around, and if she decided that you were dilated enough, you got wheeled into another room. She takes me and my IV in, in, uh, in my wheelchair into this other room where all the other women had gone, and I realized that the room that we're in is sort of a closet with a toilet. And the nurse told me to lean on her in order to push my baby into the toilet. The baby was already dead at this point, but how oh, disgraceful and disgusting that that's what we do with these children. So, that's
that hurts a lot. That I have a baby in heaven that I thought so little of that I left her in a toilet. The result was a tape of a fetus being attacked uh, by the abortionist from below while we filmed from above. In other words, at the top of the, of the uterus. And uh, the results of this film were so ghastly and hideous. It actually showed the fetus being torn apart in living color. This was not ultrasound, black and white, but this was living color. Delivering a head is very, very difficult, even at, say, 20 weeks. I mean, I had one abortionist keep a girl on the table for six hours trying to crush a head. He couldn't do it. I felt them taking parts out of my body. You know, I've spent the better part of 20 years trying not to remember that, but I do. Nobody knows what goes on in the abortion clinic. The most promising choice is the decision that favors life, the decision to carry the baby to term. In virtually every community all across the United States, there are organizations and people willing to help for the sake of a life that deserves to flourish. Organizations and people who are not driven by the desire to make money off of the despair of others. These are loving people who truly desire to help the woman in crisis make a choice, the right choice. Every day, all across this country, people from every walk of life and socioeconomic background rise up and rally to the cry of their hearts to bring an end to the lawlessness and inhumanity that is abortion. From sidewalk counseling, trying to save that life at the last moment, to marches that show our elected representatives that this matter is of the utmost importance to the organizations that try and heal the women wounded by this brutal act. Slowly, people are waking up to the understanding that abortion is wrong and needs to end, and that we as a society must see the end of this injustice. We, the people, are beginning to come to the realization that life, even life from conception, is the primary inherent right of all humanity. That woman is dead, so heartbeat. Sounds like a grown person. <laughs> <laughs> the heartbeat is 176 beats off. That's normal. That's mm -hmm. very normal. I know they say hard speed very fast. Right, yeah, and then as the pregnancy progresses, it slows down. Yeah. And every day I think about what could have been. What could have been if I had my baby. But they just don't know about the resources and they just, get, they're in complete despair. So we need to be there to love them and to show them that we care for them and to get them the help they need. So if there's a woman that's considering abortion, that to not buy that lie, that they will miss the greatest blessing of their life. And these women need to hear that, you know, that they're special and loved. It helps 100%. Because they don't want to necessarily see like big posters and signs of, of what they're doing. They know that it's wrong, they know. They want to hear that they're loved and that there's hope. Everyone that had an abortion was encouraging me not to have an abortion, basically t telling me to learn from their mistake, learn from them that it's not what I need to do. When you're fighting for your life, you need to know what you're fighting for. And if what you're fighting for is life, then how do you how do you destroy a life in an effort to fight that fight? It's, it's almost hypocritical. You know, I, I'm fighting so hard to save myself that I'll kill someone else to get that. When I share about what I've done, it's with the hope that I can reach one woman with the truth about abortion so she will not make the same choice I did. 
that she will not buy the lie. Once you heal from that abortion, all of those issues that were in your life evaporate. They go away. They get resolved. I needed to let it go. I needed to let God forgive me. And once I did, and once I really put a face on that problem, I've never had those issues with depression. It was pretty much all just about the mother, and basically it was like the child didn't even matter. It was, you know, 100% just a mother's health issue. And we knew we'd done the right thing regardless, but she, from the moment she was born, responded completely appropriately for a newborn baby, and, and there was no reason to think that there would be any anything that would come up later. I had a boy, he's two and a half now. If you look at it in terms of the continuum, uh, I know scientists like to divide, and of course we, we divide things into different categories because uh, that's how we, that's what we see, that's the best way we can actually consider the scientific facts that we're finding. But the fact doesn't change that this genetic entity that already has a gender can continue on to death. Sadly, I think if at any time one of their fathers had asked me not to abort them, I would have definitely kept that baby. I, I carried my baby to full term, and I gave her up for adoption. And I'm happy that I did. Is that abortion is really, to me, the ultimate exploitation of women. And none of that is being discussed because the reality is, is once it starts being discussed, and we really blow the lid off of this issue, and the truth has really come out about what abortion does to women, let alone the unborn baby, our dead babies, it will be over.
here I am.